So this is, uh, it's always interesting when we have these meetings in June because you never, or July, June and July, you never know what you're going to get. You never know what you're going to be focused on. Uh, whether you're going to be focused on whether we're going to have what the water supply is going to look like going through the summer or if anybody's going to be able to sell any treated water going through the summer. Uh, it's a, it certainly was a, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, it was a really interesting fall. Uh, it was certainly an interesting spring and then here we are going into the wet season or in the middle of the wet season and we can't get it to stop raining. Uh, we have passed two million acre feet of water through Possum Kingdom and Granberry since January. That is enough to have drained Possum Kingdom and refilled it twice. It's enough to have drained and refilled Lake Granberry nine times. We've had enough. Uh, so we don't have anywhere to put any more. We're full. We're going to show you that the uh, Corps of Engineer Lakes are full. And they're probably as nervous as others on the management of reservoirs moving into the uh, hurricane season. Uh, so it's going to be, it, it very well could be with uh, maybe tropical depression number one in the Gulf of Mexico by the weekend. It could be a very interesting summer moving forward. Really glad you all are here today. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I'm David Collinsworth, GM of the Brazos River Authority. I've been in that role for about a year and a half. I've uh, been with the BRA for about 25 years. Uh, started out doing environmental monitoring, so most of the bridges that you drive over, I've been under. And that's a good thing. So uh, if I haven't met you, I look forward to meeting you today and talking with you a little bit. We have uh, uh, a, a really packed agenda. Uh, we'll, we'll be done and have you out by lunch. Uh, so we're going to uh, focus on David Thompson, our CFO, is going to talk you through some of the challenges that we have and how we're looking at uh, rate making, uh, what our rate's going to look like over the years, uh, what your rate's going to look like next year. We have a lot of the same challenges that maybe you have. We have a lot of the same challenges that municipalities have. We have old stuff and we need new stuff. So how do you make rates to go in and look at infrastructure that's nearing 100 years old? Uh, how do you plan for the future? Uh, and build projects that are going to be exponentially more expensive than the projects that we had back in the 50s and 60s or 40s for that matter. We can't afford for our infrastructure to be taken out of service. Uh, the replacement value of reservoirs would be in the billions. Uh, so remember the old Midas commercial, pay me now or pay me later? Uh, so we're really aggressive on looking at, from a risk perspective, capital improvements and how we're going to prioritize those uh, to make sure that we get uh, more than a full life out of Possum Kingdom and more than a full life out of Lake Granberry and others. So a lot of challenges. Uh, Matt's going to talk with you a little bit about the legislative session. Uh, and we've got some really good news about Alice Creek that he'll share with you. Uh, Tiffany's going to talk a little bit. Uh, it's kind of an educational moment, if you will, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, all of the environmental monitoring that we do, the water that we provide you, if it's not of such a quality that you can't use it, then it's really not on the books. Uh, so we're really aggressive with our environmental protection of our up, uh, upstream of our reservoirs and then looking at the water quality in the river as it flows. Uh, and then Chris Higgins is going to be first up. So you come on up, Chris. And Chris is going to talk a little bit about our water supply. Uh, introduce you to, look, let you look at the maps and the flows and, and then uh, just give you an update on how we look going into the summer. So with that, Chris Higgins. And listen, let's, uh, let's be informal. After each speaker, if you have questions, stop us and let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk. Uh, if you don't want to ask questions, we'll hang around as long as we need to to answer and, and discuss with you whatever's on your mind. So thanks for coming. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through the last 12 months of, of what the hydrologic conditions have been in the Brazos Basin, um, which you'll see in one of these next few slides. There's been a pretty large swing. And then um, I'm going to go over kind of where we're at with our long-term water sales contracting um, under our system operations permit. Just a brief slide. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. 
So these three slides we've been showing these the last few years, it just shows the U.S. Drought Monitor um, produced by the, it's a, it's a, it's a group of, of agencies um, and it gets pushed out every Thursday. We, our, GIS, our GIS guy takes it and uh, overlays the percent full of our reservoirs in that basin and we put it out on our website every Thursday. But basically this is a snapshot for each of the year for 2017 it was May 30, for 2018 it was May 31 and then about that same time here in 2019 you can just show the progression of you know 2017 it, there was some abnormally dry and moderate drought in the central and upper part of the basin. Um, our reservoir system as a, as a, a combined reservoir system was fluctuate between 95 and 100 percent or so and then you move into 2018 um, and it started getting pretty dry um, around the May time frame you can see that the that the drought was was uh, was progressing we were about 93 percent full at that time in May so we were and then the reservoirs were dropping slowly uh, and I, by the by the end of August they were down to 80 percent it was a it was a very dry little short time span and I'll get into more of that in a second then you can see in 2019 we're, we're in good shape obviously with all the rain you know David already mentioned two million acre feet you have a limestone into that it's about 2.6 million acre feet that we passed combined for our three of our reservoirs um, so this is departure from normal graphic um, you can see the October uh, 2017 through June 25th of last year there was areas in the basin and central basin that were as much as 16 inches def rainfall deficit by by the end of June, um, and parts of the upper part of the basin were in just as worse shape. Um, it you know it was extremely dry, and you can look over here on this next graph. Fast forward to the last eight months, and you can see that we have areas around Abilene and and College Station down in the lower part of the basin, um, and and. Comanche County around where Proctor is where there was you know we received as much as 20 you know 20 inches of rain more than what we would normally see by this time uh, which is pretty phenomenal um, and I'll, I'll show that how that translates into stream flow um, with this next slide so this is our this is a the Hempstead gauge it's about 200 miles upstream of the Gulf we have, and it shows all the way from 1939 when we began collecting data at that point all the way up through this year. Um, and what we did was we just pulled the June, July, and August uh, stream flow amounts uh, for each of those years just to compare and contrast. Um, and you can see that that nine month period that we showed on that previous slide where we had the deficit, that shows it was pretty much the lowest that we had seen on record uh, as far as flow volumes in that area. Uh, generally, you know, on average you see about, and you can look at the million acre foot line, that's about average. Um, and so we were about one eighth of what we normally see on average, about 200 acre feet. And then this is a, a similar graphic, uh, about 100 miles downstream of the Richmond Gauge. We, it was just a month later, we skipped September, and then we go through the next three month period, October through December, and we see that 2018 was the most flow we had seen in the lower part of the basin, which just goes, I mean, everyone knows that Texas, the, the climate swings back and forth, and this is just a prime example of, of how things can change so quickly um, and just flip the switch from, from dry to, to extremely wet. Um, so moving along. This is another graphic that our GIS guy uh, puts out every Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what happened there. Let me go back. Okay. Is everyone looking at that one anyways? Okay, there we go. Uh, so this is our, our current reservoir status report that we put out. And it just shows our percent full and, and draw down there. Um, you, it, our system totals 100%, but if you look at the individual numbers, you can see that most of the core reservoirs are up in the flood pool. Um, I looked at it this morning, it's about, we have about 800,000 acre feet of water in flood pool. Um, when all 11 of our reservoirs are completely full, it's about 2 million acre feet. Um, so that's another way you can, the 2 million acre feet that we passed through Grand Barrier and PK, you could fill all 11 of our reservoirs completely full 
Um, so yeah, currently we have about 800,000 acre feet in flood storage, so we got a ways to go. The Corps got a ways to go to pass that in a few weeks. Um, and you can see that, um, well, the PK and Granberry show just a little bit of drawdown. We're just operating them just a little bit low while we're passing all this flood water. So once we get finished with flood operations, we'll land them back at normal full pool. Um, and those, those columns are, the, the height of those columns in relation to each other kind of show the capacity. So, you know, PK and Whitney are obviously our biggest <laughs> reservoirs, and then, you know, Crocker Quill at Georgetown and Granger are, are our smallest reservoirs. So, um, moving on along. This is a, a product put out by the uh, uh, Climate Prediction Center um, and every month, and th this one is from May through August 31st. It's given kind of a three month outlook um, on what they expect to see. Uh, so obviously, they're showing that there's, you know, the, if there was some yellow there where it says drought development likely, uh, but they're showing that there's no no drought um, likely over the next few months, which is positive as long as it quits raining for a little bit. We got um, so this is the slide. I just have this one slide just to go over. We, you know, we went through a, a pretty long process of developing a tool um, and 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 to figure out how much water we have and where we have it available now that we have acquired the system operations permit. And so our, uh, we calculated it was about 100,000 acre feet. We presented that to the board and we're moving forward with uh, coordinating with our customers and internally uh, to try to figure out who's, you know, who, who's gonna get you know, how much water. And so um, we're, you know, one of the hurdles that we gotta get through um, in between now and then is we have to update our, our contractual agreement forms um, and then we'll present that by the July Board of Directors meeting and then hopefully we'll begin executing contracts by August 2019 which is what we've been planning all along so and then this graphic we've been we've been putting this together since 2014 uh, most of you have one at your desk uh, and it's mostly self-explanatory um, I'd like to just that that graph that shows the reservoir accounting. Um, the I don't know if it's it's intuitive for everyone, but those those larger wider bars, those are all the inputs into the reservoir, all the inflows, and all the that those skinny lines with all the colors, those are all everything that leaves the evap, the the evap, the releases, the water lakeside water use, water supply releases, leakage, anything that leaves the lake. And so, when you're when you're looking at that and you see those lines squished, you can get a, an idea of you know what the evap and everything are in the table below. Um, so, and if you have any questions on that, just feel free to ask me, and I can walk you through it. So, go back to your uh, your your slide with the tubes. That right there. there. Yeah. Here's. Here's what I want to explain from this. <clears throat> For those of you that don't know reservoir operations, and you're wondering, you're seeing all the flooding and. and why what happens happens all of the reservoirs that are over 100 percent those are Corps of engineer reservoirs and those reservoirs were designed to hold flood water they're doing what they're supposed to be doing the Brazos river authority we don't have flood storage so when we're full like we are today theoretically every drop of water that comes in has to leave so that's what dictates how we operate our gates so if you go online, if you follow us on Twitter, if you follow us on Facebook and you're seeing uh, information about we're preparing to release or we're going to have releases in hours, it's all based on what we're seeing coming from upstream. The big challenge, and it's happened to us twice this spring, is when we have that red cell on the radar form and set right on top of the reservoir. Because most of, well, what we like to see is rain in the watershed coming down and it gives us time to react and understand how the water's gonna attenuate and get to the reservoir and what the impacts are gonna be. But when that cell sits right on the top of the city of Granbury or right on top of Possum Kingdom, then that's why you'll see us go to gate operations and then an hour later, another gate, an hour later, another gate. That's because we're having to respond to what Mother Nature's providing. So that's a, that's a really big challenge. But again, the, the Corps of Engineer Reservoirs, this is what they're designed to do. They're designed to hold back these large flood waters. You want to talk about your last slide or did you have one? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. So uh, who's next? Yeah. All right, Matt. Thanks, Chris.
Okay, can y'all hear me? I'm one of those people that talks with my hands, and so I don't know that I can hold them still, so I'll try to hold it up to my mouth. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what happened during the, uh, the legislative session that ended last Monday. Um, I'm gonna focus on a handful of the water-related bills that passed. Uh, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the weightier issues that the legislature dealt with, like public school finance and tax reform. Those are issues that you, know, you can read about. I'm gonna talk mainly about the uh, the water-related issues. Before I get into that, I'll say that I'm going to cover just kind of a small snapshot of them. There is a, a, a much longer, more detailed report on that back table. It's done by the Texas Water Conservation Association, who we work very closely with. It's got a real long list of all the water-related bills and much more detailed analysis than I'll go, in, you know, go into today, but take that with you and, and, and take a look at it. The other cautionary thing that I would say is even though the legislature's done, we are still in the middle of the governor's uh, signed veto period. So some of the bills I'm going to talk about, maybe some of the bills on that list that y'all take with you, still have the opportunity to be vetoed. I, I don't think that's going to happen, but it could, so, you know, watch out for that. Um, flooding. Uh, you know, we all knew going into the session that flooding was going to be a huge issue. This being the first session coming on the tail end of the <coughs> Harvey, I, I think I talked about it during the customer meetings uh, before the session. We knew it was something that the legislature was gonna focus on. It was listed as one of the governor's top five priorities, kind of the Hurricane Harvey uh, recovery aspect of it, and then how do we plan better and build infrastructure that will protect us from future floods like that. Um, so the legislature passed kind of a handful of different bills. At one point, I joke about this a lot, it seemed like every member of the legislature, all 181 of them, filed some form of a flood bill. And what the process tends to do it dwindles them down to a handful that eventually pass. Um, so I'll go through a few of those. House Bill 26, uh, some of the folks in this room will be very familiar with this, but um, it, it basically requires dam operators like the BRA to notify downstream emergency operations managers and emergency operations centers of our releases when we're making releases, what the duration of the release will be, um, what the, the size of the release will be, so that the emergency operations centers can then notify the public of the release and how long it's going to last, potential road closures, things like that. Now, obviously, that's something that we already do. We've been doing that for years, but it's not something that's formalized in statute. Not all dam operators do it. So House Bill 26 creates a, a formal process at TCQ that TCQ will oversee to make sure that all dam operators are, are providing notification when they're making releases during flood. Uh, Senate Bill 6 is very heavy on training. The purpose of this bill is to require the Texas Division of Emergency Management to require or to provide training to local jurisdictions on how to better prepare for and handle disasters. So that will be handled by TDEM and they'll be uh, working with local counties, <coughs> cities, emergency operators to make sure that they're trained up on how to deal with disasters. <coughs> Another important aspect of that bill is it creates a wet debris study group. The purpose of that group is to look at how to handle water-based debris both during and after a disaster. Who's responsible for removing it? How do you pay for removing it? Which is probably the biggest issue. Um, what comes out of that study is going to be really important because it's not it's not a small issue. Debris is a major issue in throughout the entire state during a disaster, particularly in rivers and streams, because it can make flooding worse. So that group's going to try to look at and, and, and attempt to assign responsibility on who's responsible for debris. I don't know who's going to do that. Being the, the point person, point entity on debris removal, but what I can tell you is the the cost and the scale of that uh, could be astronomical. You know, I don't know that it's fully understood the millions and millions of dollars that might be required to remove debris both during and after a disaster event. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that study. The other thing that study is going to look at is local, state, and federal regulations that exist that might get in the way of or hamper debris removal currently. And then the last three are probably the most high profile of the flood related bills that the legislature passed. Uh, taken together, they do a couple of things. Um, Senate Bill 7, along with HGR 4, which will go to the voters in November. Um, in, in some, they provide, they appropriate approximately $1.7 billion from the state, from the Economic Stabilization Fund, the Rain Day Fund, to flood related projects. So that's anything from updating floodplain maps to building heavy infrastructure to mitigate flooding, to recovering from Hurricane Harvey, so it can fund a whole suite of different things. Eventually, the funding provided in Senate Bill 7 and HR 4 
will fund what comes out of Senate Bill 8, which is the creation of a state flood planning process. Right now we have a regional water planning process that I know most of you are familiar with where the state's broken up into 16 regions. Those regions look at their area, they develop projects or recommendations for projects that need to be built to supply water. This process is gonna do the same thing except for flooding. It's gonna look at projects in a specific area or region that are needed to mitigate flooding. What all of this will tell you and what we're hearing from the Water Development Board is those guys are no pun <coughs> intended underwater. <laughs> They're going to have to spend the next year to year and a half developing rules and application processes for how to get this money out the door, for how to manage the state flood planning process. It's going to be a gigantic undertaking for them. So it's going to be something that's very interesting to watch how they staff up to do that, how they administer all that. But they got a lot of work to do. I don't need to right now. They, they got as we like to say, the legislature loved them to that in this session because they gave them plenty to do. Um, the last thing I'll say about flooding is what didn't come out of the session, and that is changes to reservoir operations. We were very concerned going into session that you might see some knee-jerk reactions from Hurricane Harvey that would require dam operators to do things like pre-release from their reservoirs in advance of a, a, a rain event or based on a forecast, or seasonally lower reservoirs like for three months during hurricane season, drop the lake two or three feet. Uh, that's obviously concerning to us because it affects water supply. But in many cases, if you guess wrong and release before forecast and the rain comes in a different spot, maybe below the dam, you could make flooding worse. It's not a practice that we do. It's not one we recommend. The legislature luckily did not look at doing that, so we think that's a good thing. Surface water. Um, a really quiet session on surface water. They didn't really touch that that much. Uh, one of the things they did do was they passed House Bill 723, which requires updates of the water availability models that TCEQ uses to, to handle water right permitting. Those models and all the basins throughout the state are out of date. They've not been updated in many years, and none of them reflect the 2011 through 2015 drought. So TCEQ will be updating those models to reflect more recent information and times. And then House Bill 1964 is interesting. It requires an expedited process for minor water right amendments. So for instance, if a water right holder has a diversion point at one spot and wants to move that diversion point to another spot on the same contiguous piece of land and that movement of that diversion point won't affect another water right, it allows that water right to move through the process faster without a whole lot of red tape. So it just helps move those minor amendments along a little bit quicker. Groundwater got a little bit more attention. Um, you can look at House Bill 720, 721, and 722 as ways to promote the use of technologies like aquifer storage and recovery and brackish groundwater development by making the permitting processes for those types of projects more streamlined, easier, and, and, and more able to understand by people that want to undertake those projects. Those are bills that have actually been looked at for a couple of sessions. They were filed last session, passed, and vetoed. Um, they were passed this session again. I don't think they'll be vetoed again, but I think those are things to watch out for for those that are looking to do ASR or brackish drought water projects. And then House Bill 1066 was a Texas Water Conservation Association priority bill. And what it does is it requires uh, transfer permits for groundwater to be issued for the same amount of time that a groundwater production permit is issued for. So, Groundwater District cannot give you a production permit for 10 years, but only give you a two-year transfer permit to move that water out of the district if you're a boat water area. They have to align those, they have to be at the same amount of time, so that there's not any sort of discrepancy between your transfer permit and uh, your production permit. And then as David mentioned, probably the biggest bill for us this session was the Allen Creek Reservoir uh, bill. Um, we've talked a lot about Islands Creek Reservoir with y'all uh, in the past. It's a project that we've been trying to move forward for many, many years. And to understand the importance of it, I'm going to go back to one of Chris's slides, if I can find one. And I don't like that one. I don't like that one either. I'm going to find that. No, that's perfect. Okay. So Allen's Creek Reservoir is a proposed off-channel reservoir that will be built down here in the Austin County area near Sealy. The reason it's important to the rest of the basin 
is it'll provide 100,000 acre feet of water for us to use to meet needs in this growing Fort Bend, Brazoria County area. And as many of you know, that area is growing extremely fast. So it'll provide us 100,000 acre feet to meet those needs. More importantly, by using it to meet those needs, we can conserve water in these upstream reservoirs. So it lets us hold water close to home longer by using it first to meet those needs. So anytime, it's, and it's gonna be an off-channel reservoir, so anytime that there's flooding down here or high flows down here, or anytime we're making releases from up here and there may not be a ton of rain down here, we can pull that water off the river, fill up Allen's Creek, and then use it first to meet those lower basin needs. So it's an extremely important project for our basin and has been for many years. The backstory on it is that the legislature issued the water right permit for the Allen's Creek Reservoir to the BRA and the city of Houston through the passage of a bill back in 1999. And at that time, things for the city of Houston and the BRA were very different than they are today. The city of Houston might have thought they needed or wanted to build Allen's Creek. The BRA didn't really know what it was doing at that time. We had water that we couldn't give away. And at the time that they issued the permit, they made Houston the 70% owner and BRA the 30% owner. And again, that was back in 1999. Fast forward 20 years, things have changed for both us and the city of Houston. The city of Houston has gone east of its service territory for its water. It's gone to the Trinity, it's gone to the San Jacinto. They've developed hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water that will meet their needs for the next 100 years. So they don't need Allen's Creek Reservoir, which will be located far west of their current service territory. For the BRA, things have changed pretty drastically as well. Population and water needs in our basin have exploded, particularly in the lower part of our basin. So what you have is you have a 70% project owner who does not need the project, and a 30% project owner who does need the project way worse than the 70% owner. So for the last 10 years, we've been working with the city of Houston, attempting to negotiate some way out of this, some way to move the project forward. Um, and most recently, for the last couple of years, we've been trying to buy them out of the project. And as we've told you all at times, we thought those negotiations were going relatively well. Uh, we finally hit an impasse shortly before the session where it was pretty clear to us that those talks were going nowhere. Um, some of our lower basin customers, the potential users of that water, fed up with not seeing any progress on the project, decided to pursue a bill, House Bill 2846, which requires Houston to accept the buyout from the Brazos River Authority. We'll pay Houston what they have in the project to date, which according to them is $23 million. And then the Brazos River Authority will become 100% owner of that project. The city of Houston will have no stake in it. The BRA will be complete and total owner. And it will allow us to begin the 404 permitting process in order to move that project forward. So it's a big step because it, it, it puts us in the driver's seat of a project that we should be in the driver's seat of. To set expectations though, we still have a long way to go. One, the city of Houston, who wasn't particularly fond of the bill, uh, they opposed it at every turn, has to accept our buyout. And even though the legislature passed the law telling them they have to, we all know how that works. So we could end up in a lawsuit trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong on that. Once we get control of the reservoir project, which we're hopeful that we will, we still have to go through federal 404 permit which is the last step before we actually turn dirt, but that process could take a number of years, three to five to seven, we don't, we don't know yet until we get into it. So just because this bill passed and we have the potential to gain control of the reservoir, doesn't mean we're gonna start turning dirt tomorrow. We've still got a little ways to go, but again, it's a big step in the process. It potentially gets Houston out of the way because they don't need the project and hopefully uh, gives us the ability to start building the thing. Uh, the bill passed pretty overwhelmingly. Um, we passed the House 143 to 5, we passed the Senate 26 to 5. So they had a lot of support in the legislature. So hopefully it's a good step in the right direction and we can get things moving forward. So I think that's all I've got, but I will be happy to answer any questions. I got a question. Yes. What is the what is the city of Houston's holding? Why would they not need this reservoir but also not need 23 million dollars? So they don't need the reservoir because they develop supplies elsewhere. So it just doesn't make sense for them to come all the way west to get it. I don't know why they want to take the 23 million. I mean, you would think, given some of the things we've seen about the city of Houston and their budget deficit, that they would, because it, it's not only the 23 million that makes sense for them. And again, this makes so much sense to, to, to us, it's hard to understand why they have been so problematic. 
but it's the cost avoidance that actually saved them money because the project is projected to cost five hundred million dollars total, and they're responsible for seventy percent of that, so three hundred fifty million. Why they would want to spend that on water they don't need, I don't understand. Their argument throughout the session was, "Well, you're you're taking something from us, and we might want it later, but we don't know." So I kind of look at it like, you ever seen a kid who has a toy that they don't play with, but when some other kid wants to play with it, then suddenly it becomes their favorite toy? That's kind of how I look at it. I mean, that, that's pretty much how they acted during the session. I mean, they, they, they have no need for it, but as soon as somebody else wants it, well, oh no, suddenly it's my favorite thing, and I don't want it. Best I can. Yes, sir. And therefore, you're able to take water out of the river to meet those permits down south when, and not release them out of the top. Is that correct? So the, the system operations permit, and you probably need to come up here and explain this, uh, Chris went through it at the tail end of his. Um, we spent a while going through and determining the water availability that the system operation permit would provide to us, firm water, and we determined it's roughly 100,000 acre feet. And we took that to our board in April, so we will now have the ability to contract for an additional 100,000 acre feet of water, uh, which we'll start contracting for, I guess, this summer? August. Uh, August. There we go. So, I mean, that 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 permit's about to be in force, used, or we're about to start issuing contracts for it. Yeah. And can you clarify when you say that? I mean, the concern we all had with the system was to retain water in the PK and the cranberry that didn't have to be released just to meet the permit. Uh, is there a game plan for that to still hold true that those those permits that are requested, if there be majority of it down south, we're still gonna have to round find the releasing water up north. Is there a game plan not to put all that acreage down south and save it for the northern part of the branches? Yeah, so the whole concept of the system operations permit is it allows us, before we weren't able to use run of the river flows downstream when it rained. Right. Even if it was wet, if we had a customer that had nothing but a contract, we had to... What? We, we, had, to rele uh, we had to release water from a stored, uh, stored reservoir, even though the river's wet. Right. The, the advantage now is that when it's when it's wet, we don't have to release from storage. We can hold that water back up in storage. And so it's it's so it's augmenting storage with run of the river flows, which we didn't have the ability to do before. And also we have, we also recognize that there's return flows from wastewater treatment plants that are in the river that we didn't get permitted for. But the state just recognizes that they're there and it gives us authorization to, to divert those waters too, which which coincidentally leaves more water in storage upstream. So right. I don't know if that answers your question. Not really, because if you permit that excess of water. So that water can be released, but 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 system ops, and you guys keep me wrong, but system ops allows us the flexibility to have water sold out of the run of the river water, but backed up by the reservoirs. But it's just not solely backed up by possible kingdom or cranberry. Because of our system, we have the ability to release that water from any of the other reservoirs. And that's another reason that Allen's Creek is even more important. Again, it's another tool in the toolbox for releasing water out of it. And I'll be very clear, I can candid, I'm public for saying this. Possum Kingdom and Granberry are at its best benefit to BRA when they're full. So we've got to do everything that we can to manage our most northern water supplies to the very best of our ability. So I'll be very candid with you here too. So that during times of extreme drought, we have water up north that can be sent to more customers downstream. Give and take. Does that answer your question? Well, to some degree. I'm not trying to get into the details. I'm just going to ask if you thought about the fact that you permit all that down the south end of the of the river, you're still going to have to release water up north. Is there a plan to, to limit some of those permits? It's it's water's being sold basin wide. Okay. 
so it's not all being sold at the very tail end of the basin. And I've got a map that we've got a slide that we don't have with us today, but I can make available to you to show you the distribution of, of how that water is going to be sold. And, that, and that's great. That's, that part is Okay, no. I'll, I'll, I'll get that part. Other questions for Matt? You just touched on an issue related, relating to Allen's Creek that, that I had someone talk to me about not too long ago when I was in Houston. And that is one of the reasons why Houston didn't want to let go of it is because they realized it was more valuable to BRA than to them and they wanted more hard. Just a very basic economic <coughs> question. Absolutely. And they made it very clear in testimony in the Senate that that water was designated for customers that they were going to sell water to in the Brazos Basin. Yeah. And, and that in itself was a problem also because we were going to end up with a trough of water that was going to be valued at one cost for the BRA's expense and another cost for what we would assume would be the city of Houston's expense. Right. And the thing I'll add to that, the reason the legislature wasn't interested in that argument is because unlike any other reservoir project in Texas, the legislature gifted this project to Houston and the BRA years ago back in 99. So that's unique, that doesn't happen. This is the only project that we know of that it's ever happened with. So the way the legislature looked at it is, Houston, we gave you this with the express intent that you were gonna develop it, but you haven't and you have no plans to. BRA wants to, what we're not gonna let you do is profiteer and charge some astronomical amount to the BRA and their water users for something that we gave you that you decided not to do. When Houston went east for their water, there's also a cost for getting that water out of the main stem of the Brazos into their system. In just rough draft numbers, we've looked at somewhere north of $250 million. So you're looking at $750 million. That's, that's an expensive water supply, especially when you already have all the water. Other questions before we move on? And again, we can, thanks Matt, we can uh, talk about this more as we go. I wanna, before I introduce Tiffany, I wanna make you an offer. Uh, for those of you that haven't been to our locations and you'd like to tour Possum Kingdom Dam, or you'd like to tour the Lake Granberry Dam, uh, let us know. You can work through Mike McClendon in the back. Uh, I can't guarantee that we can meet your schedule because we've got things going on at the dams and if we're getting ready for floodwaters and releases, that may not be the right time. But sometime this summer or this fall, if you'd like to come out and take a tour, we'd love to show you what we're working on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you've never been on a dam, they're, they're pretty big. Um, for you to do that, we've got to go through a, little, a short security check. We need your driver's license number. We've got to make sure that you're good to go. But uh, again, we'd love to introduce you to those dams and let you see them. So with that, uh, something that's really near and dear to my heart uh, is the environmental protection of, of the waters that flow in the Brazos and the source waters that flow into our, our re reservoirs. And we have an expert on our staff, Tiffany Morgan. She's our executive manager over everything that's, that's in our environmental the service department. Uh, she does, uh, a lot of the other river authorities reach out to her for advice on, on permitting endangered species, water quality, and, and we're really blessed to have her. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, what her department does. I'm just gonna give a highlight, and, and hopefully, um, as you're doing projects, if you need data, we can also be a data source for you. So if you see anything that sticks in the back of your mind and you're down the road and comes up, gee, it'd be nice to have that. Give us a call. All our data is publicly available. Um, so hopefully, first and foremost, our biggest thing is, is we do uh, basin water quality monitoring and biological monitoring throughout the basin. Um, on any given year, it ranges from 125 to roughly 175 sites depending on what the needs are, what our concerns are. And we do that, we assess all that data to state uh, surface water standards and regulations, and also uh, look for changing trends, anything that's going awry, it, it, something suddenly off. Um, and when we do find those, we'll try to go through and identify potential sources and try to look, work, if possible, with, with the local areas or, or the potential source on, on solutions to remedy. Um, one of our biggest projects we do, and these are very quiet, and we usually do them in conjunction with TCEQ, is evaluate environmental uh, standards. When they set water quality standards back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was kind of a blanket procedure. They just blanket hit it. They didn't have the time, money, or ability to develop individual standards. So we know there's some standards out there that aren't right. And that's the worst thing about a, a, a bad standard, is not only does it not protect the environment adequately, 
but it's very, it can lead to a great deal of unnecessary expense for y'all as dischargers and permittees down the road too because you're constantly trying to chase a standard that that stream segment's never probably going to meet. So we work with TCEQ quite often when we identify a segment that we think that the standard's off. <coughs> Uh, dominantly working with bacteria dissolved oxygen, algae, and temperature standards. Um, we have done in the past chloride and sulfate um, in the upper basin sections, but uh, and we are also doing uh, some of those of you uh, know about the Texas environmental flow standards. Those were again kind of a quick one year to develop standards based off hydrologic records. So now we're going back trying to collect the biology and everything else to support are the mandated flow tiers beneficial in, in, in doing good or did we miss? Do we need to adjust them? So we're, we're actively out doing those at, at nine locations across the basins where we have environmental flow standards developed by TCEQ. Reservoir fisheries habitat improvements. Um, this came up through the system operations permit process and, and the negotiation of the water management plan. So we've been out, some of those of you on Granbury, we've done some projects on Granbury and MGK already to increase the drought resiliency of the reservoir fisheries. So in 2011 when that drought started and the lakes got really low, something became very apparent was once they got so low because everyone was needing to use them for water supply, the fish habitat was very degraded in those lower basins or lower parts of the reservoirs because they don't normally get sunlight. So there wasn't vegetation. There wasn't a lot of cover, and as that drought went on for multi years, it started to become worried about fishery production and could the fishery self sustain itself without adequate habitat. So, this study is going in. We rotate about three <coughs> reservoirs a year. Um, fortunately, building fish habitat in deep waters is not very expensive, um, and building and deploying structures that can, they're artificial, of course, so it's not as great as it a natural plant sand, but. Will, if we get low, that low again, hopefully provide uh, the fisheries the ability to have habitat to withstand a prolonged drought if, God forbid, it ever happens again. Um, this, this is something rather new to us, and I say new, it's been something we've been watching in the last 10 years, but threatened and endangered species. If you watch the process, there are activist groups that We'll kind of focus and move around the United States and start uh, filing petitions with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on threatened and endangered species. And in the last 10 years, Texas has, it has come into their sites. Um, so we have actively been monitoring that process. We have participated in the comptroller's efforts on freshwater mussels. Now we are actively uh, negotiating with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service a endangered species or what they call candidate conservation agreement with assurances, which is a pre-listing permit to try to secure our water supply or if these mussels are endangered by doing other conservation methods that should benefit the mussel. Um, but endangered species and especially the aquatics, which has seemed to be the focus for, for Texas as of late, can be very damaging and in other states they have taken large loss of water out of the water supply systems of other states. So this is something we take very seriously. Um, Brazos water snake is on the state uh, threatened list and has been for years, so we know that that's one we're right for coaching. So we're starting some projects this year to begin to collect data. One of the, the biggest problems is there's usually not a lot of data on these species. They're not things people look at. Um, no one ever really, we knew fresh water mussels were out there, but honestly, even my crew of people who like to play with bugs and fish and snakes didn't really ever pay much attention to them. So we're trying to get ahead of that by gathering the science before it ever becomes an issue. So either hopefully we can fight it or come up with our own conservation measures to make those listings more difficult to make a case for in the future. Also, uh, everyone knows about the scourge of zebra mussels that has marched down from the Great Lakes and hit Texoma about 10 years and has steadily just flown through the, the state. So on reservoirs that, that don't have them, we do coordinate our monitoring with parks and wildlife, but we do a pre-detection monitoring looking for villager zebra mussels, DNA. Um, we also look for the adults, but hopefully we can have some early warning. It doesn't really 
do much other than let people with intake structures know they need to start watching them and develop a, a maintenance plan. There's nothing we can do to stop or control it. And we also keep an eye on uh, invasive plants. Fortunately, we have not had a major plant problem in our basin. We've had a few instances we've been able to get on top of it quick, but um, San Jacinto River Authority, the Sabine River Authority, they spend millions of dollars a year on invasive plant control in the reservoirs. So we do try to keep a, a, a strong eye on that so that doesn't become a problem for us. When we do find an issue that, that's bigger than just a standards adjustment, we will try to uh, work with local communities to develop plans to identify sources and identify solutions to those sources. Um, these are just some of the different uh, studies we've done in the past along that regard. Um, doesn't look like a huge list, but, but most of those are, are multi-year, five-plus year studies and events of coordinating back and forth with the local communities. And when it comes up, this probably more in, in for y'all than at any of our other groups, we work hand-in-hand uh, -hand with our lake rangers on investigating environmental offenses against our reservoirs and streams and, and have occasionally assisted some uh, other lo local law enforcement agencies, some of the sheriff's departments in the area, when they have a, a case or something concerning them they're trying to make. So whatever they need at that point in time, sometimes it's just to help interpreting one of the uh, water code laws and sometimes it's actual pulling samples and, and doing some analysis for them. Uh, we support all our BRA facilities with permitting support services for all the environmental support uh, environmental permits that are out there. Um, we've done at least one of these on every one. Uh, that's a picture of a dewatering event at Lake Granbury where we had to do an aquatic uh, life relocation permit for parks and wildlife and we were pulling fish out of a very small concrete box in the stilling basin. And this is just kind of our summary of our biggest overall issues and concerns we see uh, with water quality. The biggest one is, of course, balancing competing entries. Uh, often water quality and water supply are kind of at odds with each other. Uh, population growth is another one. A, not only are we limited on water supply, more people in the basins means more disturbance in the natural area, so you have more potential for impacts to water quality. Nutrient regulations have kind of been hanging out there right now. EPA's gone kind of radio silent on developing those for streams and rivers. They've done some reservoirs. Um, TCEQ and the EPA were kind of battling over remaining reservoirs. I think Granbury is one of the ones they're still battling over on what that standard should be. Um, I would expect if we have a change in regime that quietness will, will go away and they will be very active again. They, they got very quiet after the last uh, federal regime change. Um, so that could be a huge impact, especially to those of you that have TPDS permits because y'all are gonna be the low-hanging fruit that are easy to fix, and it's much easier to regulate you than a cattle producer or a feral hog. Uh, climate variability, droughts to, to floods. Um, right now, we had a beautiful uh, sampling schedule for this spring, and, and we've managed to uh, accomplish one biological monitoring event, because water flows are just too high for us to get out there. Destruction of riparian vegetation, that, does occur sometimes up here, but it's definitely a lower basin problem where people have clear cut over uh, history to the edge of the river. It causes a lot of erosion, a lot of sediment deposition, uh, can sometimes lead to more flooding issues depending on where that sediment gets deposited. Also, taking the vegetation away raises the temperature of the water because it's not shaded, so that's a big issue. And then overall, just a, a history of Rush science regulations and standards and regulations being based on things other than hard science that proves they're going to be effective. So, so those are things we all try to uh, keep an eye on and, and work and prevent when we have the ability to. Any questions? Thank you, Tiffany. A couple of things real quick. When you drive up and down the road and you see drain and dry, clean drain and dry, parks and wildlife, uh, BRA is a financial contributor to that. City of Dallas, Trinity River Authority. Uh, that's, a, that's a really important thing to us. I am 
as a biologist, I am shocked that they're not in Possum Kingdom in Lake Granberry. The, the, the habitat is perfect. It's just like Texoma. It's just like so many of the other Central Texas reservoirs that, that are infested. And if you are, uh, if you have infrastructure in the river or in a reservoir, I'm not telling you that you need to go, you need to go uh, make improvements to that infrastructure, but in your long-term planning, you need to plan for uh, dealing with zebra mussels. In Williamson County and in Bell County, the reservoirs that are infested, we are seeing significant impacts on operations and movement of water. And it is only going to get worse, and all future infrastructure improvements there will deal with coatings uh, that deal with zebra mussels and how to treat them in pipelines, how to treat them in pumps. Uh, and we, our staff, would be more than willing to sit and visit with you and share with you kind of the lessons learned, what we've seen in just three years. Uh, so it's significant. Uh, David Thompson, our CFO, will now walk you through uh, kind of a rate making discussion and then we'll talk about our system right moving forward. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this is going to deviate from my normal presentation I have. I'm actually going to show you this model we use for making our rates and then walk line by line through it and show you what's in rate making and then how we you know, come up with the final numbers. It is kind of a complicated slide here, but uh, we'll just start off with the expenses right here and the operating expenses that we have. Uh, FY29 to FY2020, uh, we had a $3 million increase, and that's due mainly to the Corps of Engineers budget increase between the two years. And the Corps of Engineers, we do help supply the maintenance that's done on our eight core lakes within the basin. Next 32 debt service payments. The first one is called subject to coverage, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, uh, and if you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, and that one is basically the East Williamson County, and we have the intake at Lake Rang uh, uh, Lake, uh, Ranger, and that also has the Taylor facility, the, the water treatment plant. The, debt the other debt service is our loans, and these are loans that we have with the Corps of Engineers for the water storage in our eight core lakes. Also, we have state, state participation loans as well with Allen's Creek. And in 2019, we basically had 30%. And as Matt told you earlier, we now have taken over the 70%, which is a $1.5 million increase in interest expense. Operating expenditures, these are projects that we do for studies, assessments, uh, IT, that could be minor repairs, software, these are, do not build our capital uh, infrastructure. So therefore, they're included in the rate as well. Now then we have other revenues. We have the non-system uh, rate uh, con contracts we have, and these are utilities and are basically two-tier contracts. We have other revenue supplies, which is basically our water treatment and waste treatment plants that we own, uh, the lake uh, permits we, we collect from, and the interest we get from our investments. The last piece is our debt coverage. But if you go back up to the debt coverage we have up there for the East Williamson County, we're required by our board is set that we have to have a 1.3 uh, ratio of coverage for that. So you basically take 30%, multiply it times the 2.5, and that's the 760,000. So you take these three elements, you take the expense, take out the revenue, add back to 760, and that's basically what is required by the system rate holders that we need for 2020. Now, if you take the acre feet, which was 372 in 19, and look at 468, that has the SysOps uh, acre feet in it. You divide that into the number, and we came up with 82 and 82 in both years. Now, if you can remember back in 2019, our rate was from, went from 18 to 19, from 74 to 76, uh, 50. It should have gone to 82. So we use another tool that we use in our rate making called Rate Stabilization Reserve. That helps to smooth out the rates so we don't have huge incline. As the rate increases though, it, it recovers itself and gets caught up with that. So in 2020, we just sent out letters oh, three or four weeks ago saying that we're gonna have $79 is our rate. Well, with the advent of uh, Allen's Creek and the 70%, it should be 82. So 
So again, we're using great uh, stabilization reserve to pull it back down to 79. Later, I'll talk a little bit about the forecast of this. So now getting into what we have proposed revenue for 2020. You can see the 37 million is the, the amount that we're going to get from the $79 HRP. You can see the uh, non-system contracts, and this is the 11.6 I talked about. There's the rate stabilization reserve. And now we have another one that's called cost reimbursement. And as you know, this is where we manage uh, our customers' facilities. For every dollar of cost that is, we build them back that dollar. So you'll see in the next slide, there is the 12.8, so it's an offset to each other. Here's the rest expenses we've talked about. The operating expense of 42.7, the uh, project cost that we're talking about, the operating projects, and then the debt service cost. So here's a list of the operating projects, and these are projects, again, that do not build out our capital, main capital infrastructure. There are certain projects in here that we do recover from grants as well as other stakeholders. But we have a pretty good list for 2020 of projects to do in our basin. <coughs> as I mentioned before, uh, the Corps of Engineers, we work, work with them in getting the, their budgets and their operating expenses to have to maintain the eight core lakes that are out there. Uh, the Corps does a great job of maintaining the eight, the eight lakes and but it's about $18 per acre foot as part of the rate. So here's the capital projects in, for next uh, 2020. As you can see, the new water, Allen's Creek is a big chunk of that. And here's the list of the projects. We have $30 million that we've had projected for the 2020. In that 30 million is the 23 million that Matt talked about that we're gonna pay. The balance is getting the project started in 2020. The rest of these projects are to uh, maintain uh, the three lakes that we own ourselves. Uh, there's one piece in here for uh, Lake Belton still has pipeline, and that one is a project we're getting ready to start as well. So here's the water that we're going to sell. 719,000 acre feet, 65% of it, which is the 468,000 acre feet. And you can see the other pieces that make, make up the, the 719,000 acre feet. Here's a breakdown of each of the groups. The next largest group, what I talked about, is the, is the two tier and basically the utilities. And then the other groups that we have agricultural. So if you convert the acre feet into 1,000 gallons and looked at that on a price per basis for that, we actually didn't increase the rate of more than less than 1%, one penny for both uh, you know, going from 19 to 20. Now take a look at the longer range forecast here. You can see we have an even keel of, of the rates going up. This is encompassing things we talked about just a second ago, which is Allen's Creek, Tanner Gates. Uh, still have a power uh, <coughs> pipeline. And here's the debt that builds up from those projects. So capital projects are not directly to your rates, it's indirectly through the debt uh, and service payments that we have to pay. Last is just taking a look at what this rate stabilization reserve does. Here we're using 1.8 and 1.3 here. It does catch up. It then dips down a little bit and then dips down a little more here. In this dip here, it's basically putting money back into the rate stabilization reserve, or another way to say it, we're self-funding a lot of our projects and not incurring additional debt. And this is just a reminder about interrupt water that's coming up. Uh, priority request less than a thousand acre feet. Uh, you have the deadline is August 30th. We do have established firm deadlines for payments, the next year contract, and as usually the board approved the interrupt the water in the October board. And that's all I have. So any questions? A lot of numbers, a lot of information, but any questions? I got one. Sure. Uh, 
sermon out on the creek. I saw the cost was in there, but I didn't see the uh, potential uh, revenue from, from future customers generated by the project. It, it's, it's built into the rate itself. So if you go back to here, as we get out of this period, this is now encompassing the rate. So you start setting the rate. Like, this ops is right in here. Allen's Creek would be out here somewhere as we start selling the water. For that. So those future revenue projections are rolled into that. The, the, real, the real question right here is how precise are those numbers? So that's why we're spending a lot of time. <coughs> that's why we're spending a lot of time making sure that through our risk assessment of our assets, uh, we can begin to put our fingers on what those costs are going to look like. So every year that we come back to you, these numbers can be more and more precise. Because there's a lot of things that we project, uh, one being the cost of a $500 million reservoir, uh, that depending on what we find in permitting may reduce the cost or increase the cost. I met last Friday with the engineer that we have on staff uh, that we have, uh, will soon have under contract, Stantec, uh, which is, is a, a, an engineering firm that's worldwide known for building reservoirs. And our only discussion was on cost, uh, financial accountability because we want to put in milestones to where I can report back to the board and the customers to show how we're going to control cost and monitor the cost of these large projects like Allen's Creek moving forward. Does that answer your question? So when we do these projections, uh, we're assuming that we will sell 100% of Allen's Creek, uh, which would be 100,000 acre feet. What's not rolled into this is there are some other advantages to system operations for Allen's Creek that may make twenty to 30,000 more acre feet of water available. So that projection is not rolled into here. The other projection that's not rolled into here is a product that we sell every year uh, that we have water, dependable, safe water available, and that's interruptible water. And because by nature it is interruptible, uh, we don't forecast that in our rates. But it's a given. When the reservoirs are like they are today and there's water flowing in the river, we're going to have interruptible water to make a recommendation to our board. I will, uh, to further answer your question, all of these slides will be on our webpage. Uh, we will also, right next to these slides, I'll put the system operations permit slides that we showed our board at the April board meeting so that you can look at those. Uh, the, all of the projects that David listed, uh, here's what I'd offer to you uh, because this information is really hard to present without taking hours and hours and hours. <coughs> and even CFOs don't want to do that. Um, if, if your organization wants us to come sit down with you and walk you through these projects and help justify what we have in our rates, we'll certainly come do that. And that was the reason for us moving this meeting uh, into June, or, or eventually I want to have this meeting in May so that we have time to talk about what's in those rates before we go to our board to ratify that in July. Any other questions? Uh, before we, before I turn you loose, uh, I talked about the slides a little bit. Uh, I would, uh, I've already had one question about Lake Aquila. Let me give you an update on Lake Aquila. We've talked about Lake Aquila pool rise. Uh, the likelihood of that project took a dive about two weeks ago when I received a letter from the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army telling me that there'll be no uh, flood, there'll be no reallocations in the flood storage. Uh, we are responding to that. Uh, the interest here is that the Corps of Engineers staff all the way up to his office approved the project and thought it was a good project to do until it got to his office. And what he's seeing is lawsuits coming in from Hurricane Harvey and lawsuits coming in from other parts of the world where they're being sued over flooding issues. So he's just saying, okay, no more reallocation in the flood storage. That's very problematic for us because we see reallocation of reservoirs as a potential water supply moving forward. So we're drafting a letter. We've got a national organization that's behind also that's really interested uh, in that letter and how we're responding. The other thing that was a challenge, and I think we reported this uh, maybe to you last year, the price tag versus the amount of water that we were getting was becoming problematic. So we'll deal with that also. But we were looking at if we were going to do that somewhere in the $30 million range for 2,000 acre feet of water. So that's becoming really expensive water. 
But nonetheless, the issue on the table is how we're going to deal with the, uh, the, the uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary of the Army and his ability to just override everybody in the process and say no. The bigger issue is Lake Whitney. We want to look at reallocating the water in Lake Whitney. It doesn't involve impacting the flood storage, but it, Im it impacts reallocation. And basically what he said is there'll be no reallocation. So we're gonna deal with that. Uh, I'm sure we'll spend some time in DC dealing with that. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's out there. Questions, comments, thoughts? It's too easy. <laughs> I do want to, uh, before I let you go, uh, Angela Orr with Representative Cody Harris's office is here. Thank you for coming today. I know you guys are just on the backside of uh, legislative session and, and we just think we were busy. So uh, I know you guys are coming off a, a real busy time and, and we appreciate you being here. Also, uh, I don't know if some of you know this and some of you may not, uh, the governor of the state of Texas appoints our board of directors and we have two of our board members here, Mr. Rick Huber is here. Rick, thanks for coming. And then Mr. Jim Lattimore is here. So uh, it's always great to have our board members at our meetings to meet you guys and, and to uh, interact with you. So lunch, lunch plans. Did we do lunch? Through that door? Yes, sir. Chicken fried steak? Chicken fried steak. And uh, our staff will be around to answer any questions. And again, I really appreciate you being here and take advantage of us however you can for our information. Thank y'all.